Welcome everyone to Dr. Carter G. Woodson, The Origins and Significance of Black History. This two-part webinar presented by historian and educator Marcus Sankofa Nix. Marcus is going to provide an in-depth history of black, of black history and the life of Dr. G, Carter G. Woodson, who is known as the father of black history. I'm going to share now some background information on our presenter, Marcus Nix, this evening. Marcus Sankofa Nix holds a Master of Arts degree in African American Studies from Morgan State University of Baltimore, Maryland. His research primarily focuses on African American educational history post-Civil War through the Jim Crow era in the United States. An instrumental aspect of his work as historian and research researcher is through the in-depth exploration of African-American educational history of Maryland and local Howard County. He has worked in Merrill, Maryland's Howard County public school system for over 12 years as an achievement liaison for the Black Student Achievement Program, working to eliminate educational disparities amongst Black and African-American students. He has served as a consultant for numerous educators on supporting Black and African-American students through a culturally relevant trauma-informed approach. He is the co-teacher of the African-American Studies Seminar course and serves as a member of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Coalition for Wildlife High School of Columbia, Maryland. His work in the community extends from Howard County, Maryland to Baltimore City with the TNAT Holistic Wellness Center, where he supports Black families towards achieving optimum wellness through what he refers to as a culturally based African centered model. He also enjoys collaborating with local institutions of public history where he serves as an educational consultant and one who provides professional development support for K through 12 educators across the state of Maryland. Marcus's mission is to empower, educate and inspire others through the awareness of African American culture and history. He is a proud husband, father and son who is passionate about his role to uplift his community. And on behalf of the Howard County Library System, I want to welcome Marcus tonight, and I'm gonna turn it over to him to get us started. So thank you, Marcus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you, Sharice, as well. And thank you to the Howard County Public Library System for having me. I am so delighted and honored to be able to speak and present yet again in an area of my passion for African-American culture and history. And for those who are with us, uh, I'm not sure if you are aware, some of you may, some of you may, you may not be, but we did this in the summertime. We had a three-part series and it went so great. It went, it went very well, in my opinion. And so I'm glad to be here to speak before you again. And so, of course, uh, time, a lot of times, time oftentimes can get away from us. So we're gonna go right into the presentation and right into uh, the topic at hand. So as it's already been said, we are going to be talking about Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the origins and significance of Black history. And this is Black History Month. So I can imagine whether you're on social media, whether there's businesses that are putting out statements, whether there's recognition and things taking place on the internet or on TV. This is Black History Month, but it is important to go back into time and to go back into history and understand the depths and the importance and the meaning and the roots behind what we celebrate and what we take part in today. And so we'll do just that uh, for today. And next week, we'll be doing this at the same time, same place, because this is a two-part web series. So we'll go ahead and uh, proceed and move forward from here. Just some things to be mindful of, just some things to be cognizant of. As we move forward in this presentation and eventually later on, we'll have a dialogue and discussion. I encourage everybody to be open. There may be some things that are shared that you may know, and there may be some things that are shared that you may not know. So nevertheless, I do ask, uh, we ask if everybody just be open uh, and be uh, willing to take in information that you may not know so you can learn. We also encourage everybody to listen actively, to be able to take as much in as they can, reduce distractions, so that way you can be able to maximize what you came to receive today by way of the presentation. We ask everybody to be present. Of course, you're present physically, but 
uh, one of the ways we can also make sure that we are as present as we can be is to eliminate distractions uh, and be mindful of our environment and our spaces that we're in. Uh, we also uh, encourage the camera on typically, but this is a webinar, and so I don't believe in this format, it'll be necessarily important to have your camera on. But definitely having the camera on can make a difference. I know being in the school system when things were virtual and when I was at home teaching and, and working with students, it made a difference when I saw some of those faces smile back at me whenever we were virtual. So having the camera on can enable us to connect, but for this type of setup, uh, it's not as important for this evening. We also ask you to continue to be mindful of your mute status. Uh, please keep yourself mute so everybody can be able to hear what's said. We also encourage questions to be asked. And so, as I stated already, we'll have time later on for a conversation, a Q&A, for those to have uh, an opportunity to ask questions. We encourage everybody to embrace their discomfort. When we talk about history, some use the term hard history. History is not always necessarily feel good. It's not always lovey-dovey. History is messy, it's murky, it's gray. It is, there are a lot of uncomfortable truths, I would say, to history. And so as we embrace all of that, it could rise up and bring about some emotions that are not that comfortable. Nevertheless, however, it could be an opportunity to grow. And then last and most certainly not least, before we move forward with the presentation for this evening, we do ask that everybody respect all viewpoints uh, and all opinions. We may not agree necessarily, but if we can open ourselves to all perspectives and other vantage points, then we should be uh, that much further along and being able to connect. So we're gonna go on this journey this evening together and go scroll back uh, the layers and really uncover uh, what we know as Black history how it came to be and all of the ancillary factors surrounding the subject matter. So for our series here, we are going to be touching upon a few different things. And so as, to, as a way to, to put it in place and structure it so everybody can be clear on what it is that we are gonna be spending time talking about for today's session and for next week's session, we're going to be speaking on uh, the historical black educational tradition, which really builds up and gets us to black history month celebrations. And before it was black history month, it was actually Negro history week. And we'll talk about how that came about. We're also gonna spend some time talking about the legacy of Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, uh, in my opinion, is becoming more known, but I, I believe he's one of the least known, least taught, talked about historic figures. And so we're going to talk about his legacy. I'm going to talk about how he situates himself in the history of Black history and what his legacy was, what his contributions have been, and how he paved the way and why what he brought to the forefront and what he and how what he brought to the table was so impactful important, meaningful, and significant. And then lastly, over the course of these two weeks, uh, we're going to also touch on Black history knowledge and how it could impact in a positive way our mental health and wellness. So it's one thing to learn about Black history. It's one thing to go back in time and to uncover layers of the past. But as we move forward to present and contemporary times and then into the future, how can this impact us mentally? How can this impact our overall wellness? And so there's research and there is data on how Black history can impact us. And so we're not going to necessarily be able to cover all of it today. But nevertheless, the idea and the goal is for us to cover all of it over the course of these next two weeks. So we're going to start with a quote from Maya Angelou. Uh, the writer, the author, the actress, uh, the phenomenal figure, uh, the writer, and she's known by this quote of many, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. There is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. So when we speak to, or when we think about 
what Maya Angelou is speaking about. She's speaking about a story that for so long has not been told. And so Maya Angelou in her early lifespan, in her um, early years, went through some traumatic situations. She went through abuse. She went through agony. She went through distress. And she you know, was silent about it for a few years on end until she decided to use the pen and the paper and begin her healing process to be able to tell her story. And it was cathartic for her. It was uh, a way for her to express herself, a way for her to process her emotions. And it was therapeutic for her. But if we look at the African-American experience, if we look at the Black experience in a broader context, we could also see that historically, up until now, especially when we're talking about the education systems and the educational practices that African-Americans have been subjected to, there has been a story that has not been told. There has been expression that has not been able to be had. Uh, voices have been silenced. And so we still continue to see that play out in many ways today. And so there was a study that was done in 2015 by the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And in that study, they were trying to galvanize educators of social studies and of history all throughout the country. And what they were trying to do was gather some intel and some insight on the politics of teaching African American history over the course of the nation as it pertains to different educational landscapes and different school jurisdictions. And they pulled together K through 12 educators and asked them a series of questions over interviews and data collection and what, and they found many things. And as a result of this study, some of the things that stood out was when it comes to the subject matter of African-American culture and history, the top four most frequent topics taught was the forced African migration or the slave trades, the Brown versus Board of Education uh, situation in 1954, uh, especially in the realm of education, the civil rights movement, and the Obama election. And so these, in terms of the, the questioning and the data responses that they got from the teachers, these were the things that came about in terms of data. They also was able to, to, to go deeper and discover that even these topics that, ca that came about as the most frequently talked about topics, they were glossed over. So it wasn't an in-depth teaching of these topics. There was poor training and support around being able to properly uh, teach these topics. They also discovered that there was an adequate time to plan and prepare to teach these topics. They also discovered that many of those teachers were frustrated due to the lack of resources that they were provided to teach. And they found that it was very uncomfortable emotionally for many of these teachers to even deal with a subject matter such as such as these topics. Uh, the guilt was there, the anxiety was there, the nervousness was there, just the discomfort was there in terms of having difficult conversations. And so when we speak about the story that, it, that it's not been told, it's, as I mentioned before, many of these educators were speaking about how it really was kind of glossed over anyway. If they had to think of what was taught, these were the four things being taught, but it still didn't mean that it was taught with great depth. It still didn't mean that it was taught with the nuance and the complexity that it deserved. And even if you look at these time periods, the African migration uh, or, the, or some would say the forced migration or slave trades from the continent of Africa all throughout the Americas and throughout the diaspora, Brown versus Board of Education, Civil Rights Obama, there's a lot of gap between these different areas. And so this was, these were uh, the outcomes uh, as it pertains to the study uh, that was provided by the National Museum of African American uh, History and Culture. And so the reason why I believe that that's important as we move on in this presentation and discussion is because it makes me think about a, a historian, a person who refers to himself as a, as a cultural memory specialist. His name is Dr. Anthony Browder. And he has a book here that has been a book that has been really instrumental in my growth and development. It's entitled Nile Valley Contribution to Civilization. And he speaks about 
this concept of erasure. The, and he's quoted saying, quote, the past has been erased and the erasure has been forgotten. And in an interview, he's pretty much addressing what he means when he says that quote. And so he draws attention to 1832, uh, there's a speech that is being given by Henry Barry Esquire, who was a, uh, a politician um, in the state of Virginia during the time for the Virginia House of Delegates. And he is a, a proponent of slavery. He is an advocate of the institution of slavery, Henry Barry Esquire. And he says this, quote, we have so far as possible closed every avenue which light may enter the slave's mind. If we could extinguish their capacity to see the light, then they could be on the level of the beasts of the field. Work would be complete and we would be safe. And I'll read that again. Quote, we have so far as possible closed every avenue which light may enter the slave's mind. If we could extinguish their capacity to see the light, then they could be on the level of the beast of the field. Work would be complete and we would be safe. End quote. So with this erasure and that Dr. Browder speaking to and bringing into account the words that Henry Barry Esquire is saying, he's saying in order for us to be safe, in order for us to maintain some sense of control, in order for us to um, maintain our status and position of power, it is important to make sure that we don't give, bring the light to the darkness of the slave's mind. Frederick Douglass said, knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. So the erasure, the keeping of knowledge, the keeping of information, uh, not being able to access literacy, not being able to read, not being able to write, not being able to teach, not being able to learn, anything that was about empowerment or self-betterment was an ultimate no-no and was a pop problem and an issue that would threaten the whole circumstance of slavery. And so you see that there's a lot going on today, but if we look back in time, we'll see that what's happening today isn't necessarily so far off from that which has happened before in the past. And so strolling down um, memory lane, going back into to the ancient uh, time period as we move our way up, we see that this erasure of history is something that even took place on the continent of Africa and ancient Egypt or at this particular time and period, or as Dr. Anthony Browder refers to as ancient Kemet, Ale uh, the, the Alexandria Library, you know, as being uh, the, the books and the scrolls and the literature and the knowledge and the records are being burned and are being stolen and are being transported to another area. And so ancient Africa, you know, it is in Africa is known as the cradle of civilization, the birth of humanity uh, and uh, the origin of species and all of those things that have been uh, proven by science and excavators and archeologists and historians and researchers. However, we see the invasions and we see even stemming far back in ancient times on the continent of Africa, this concept or notion of erasure, removing the documents and not giving credit to those who rightfully deserve to have that credit, uh, and we don't have to get into it right now in particular because we're going to move forward to more contemporary things. But the continent of Africa was known to give birth to so many things that our world today is able to benefit from, from medicine to mathematics to science to writing systems, family systems, uh, cooking systems, uh, and all different elements of culture. So we see that, once again, this is an example of many in time of what we can consider an erasure of history or an erasure of knowledge or erasure of the tools that can help get us back that provide that historical context. We also can see the erasure through the right wash in film and in media. So Imhotep was an individual, according to uh, a number of records. It's also indicated in the book that I shared and in other 
um, resources. Uh, Imhotep was known as a physician, uh, the world's first philosopher. He was an intellectual. He was a scribe, an architect. And the name Imhotep itself means he who comes in peace. So not only was he intellectually astute, not only was he studious, but he also was considered one to have high character. However, um, we, you know, as the movie The Mummy is created and that's projected uh, to the masses via Hollywood, it doesn't necessarily reflect what Imhotep, uh, what his skin color was supposed to have been according to historical records and historical accounts. So we can see the erasure also through the whitewashing. I've done research uh, for Howard County educational history. I've done research on segregated color schools in the Howard County public school system before schools actually desegregated. And from conducting oral history interviews and talking to those who attended Harriet Tubman Junior Senior High School, which was uh, the first school in Howard County where Blacks could get an education, a high school education that would take them to the 12th grade. They had to fight tooth and nail to be able to get this facility. And when they finally was able to get this facility, because they were used to having such second class amenities, such un under resourced, underfunded, uh, building space and rooms and inadequate conditions to learn in, these students had to learn how to use plumbing. These students had to learn how to use the bathroom. These students had to learn how to deal with a lot of things that the white schools already had. They were the Johnny come lately to be able to get the busing. And so these individuals here that I had a chance to talk to, Ms. Bordenay, Mr. Lyles, and Mr. Sands, they shared with me when I talked with them and had conversations with them that even whenever they was able to obtain the school, even whenever they was able to have rights to be able to go to this school, the only school in Howard County where Blacks could go from 1949 up until 1965 when the County Power County Public School System desegregated, they still wouldn't put the name Harriet Tubman on the building. So even as you see here, it says Harriet Tubman building, when the school was first erected, when the school was first established, the name Harriet Tubman would not be allowed to go on the building. So once again, you see an example of this erasure, whether it is the whitewashing, whether it's the removal of documents, whether it's the lack of access, or just the lack of being able to identify and connect with an ancestral historical figure that's an empowering one to help uh, build identity, sense of self, self-confidence, self-confidence, and self-esteem. And so as we move to present day, I'm sure there are a number of us who are familiar with the ongoing contentious debates and, and, and discussions and issues surrounding critical race theory and the erasure of history, what should be taught, what shouldn't be taught. And these discussions that have been uh, bubbling over in board meetings and district meetings and school boards is not conversations that are just happening in the South, but all throughout the country, there are contentious discussions as it pertains to critical race theory and what it is, what it's not, should it be taught, should it not be taught, and what are its implications. So once again, we see continuously this erasure and banned books. And so there's an article that I came across recently, and it was uh, from... Um, it was from the library, the American Library Association Office for Intellectual Freedom. And in 2020, according to the, the article, according to the source, it says that 273 books were banned due to censorship policies. So once again, history can give us, give us context and it can inform us how far we've come and where we still need to go. And it can help us make sense of where we're at today, how we got here today, by having that historical background. So, as I mentioned before, and with this, with us talking about Black history, 
it, it's hard to talk about Black history without centering the, ed, the Black educational tradition and the Black educational legacy uh, with, you know, associated with Black history. So when we talk about Carter G. Woodson, which we'll talk about soon, and when we talk about the, the, the striving and the, the, and the burning desire and, you know, the tenacity and the further pursuit of trying to educate oneself for, from the African all the way up to the African-American tradition, education has always been a tool uh, that has been highly respected and that has been highly sought after and highly valued. And so in the book, Deep um, Like the Rivers, Thomas Weber <clears throat> speaks to the Black educational tradition uh, that really has been continuous up through time. And he speaks about this notion of education and how we can imagine Black education and why it was so important. And so when we talk about education, he says in, in, in the book that education was the effort to transmit learning and the process by which learning occurred. It wasn't just content and it wasn't just information that was being imparted, but it was the attitude. It was the value system. It was the skills and the sensibilities of the individual and also the group collectively. So when it comes to the Black educational tradition, it wasn't just about one individual gaining their education, but it was also about the family or the community being able to also get their education because education would open up many doors, upward mobility, access to education could then um, turn around and help others have access to education. And then there was vicarious learning or secondary learning. So even though on the plantation, on the slave plantation, even if all of the enslaved did not have a chance to grapple with literacy, if they did not have a chance to learn how to, how to be able to, to write or be able to uh, make sense of words and engage with, with literacy, they could be able to listen and hear the stories and be able to hear others talk and be able to internalize information and process information as well. So education has always been a significant part of the Black experience, um, even with the, the roadblocks and the obstacles that have been in the way. When we talk about education as well, one of the points that Thomas Weber makes is that it's not just about, uh, you know, the attitude and the values and the skills and sensibilities and the content, as we just mentioned, those things are important as well, too. But it was also about form. When we talk about form or pedagogical approaches, we're talking about how the information was delivered, how the information was conveyed. So I know with my experience in the school system, um, a lot of times the focus and the emphasis is on the information. What is the information that is being imparted? What is the information that is being given? And can you regurgitate it and give it back? Now that's the element of education, but from the perspective of Thomas Weber and what he's speaking to and his book, you know, Deep Like the Rivers, Education in the Slave Quarter Community, 1831 to 1865, in this context, he, we're also talking about form. So form in terms of song, form in terms of, uh, of, of poetry or speech techniques or movement uh, or uh, all of these different elements that help to deliver the content, a, a, a communal reality where relationships were central to the educational practices and procedures. So this was part of this, edu this Black educational tradition, this Black educational heritage that was very much important, which Black history uh, uh, grew out from. And so there's a, there's a book called Fugitive Pedagogy, and I'm, I'm raising up, you know, a number of different books. Um, so, you know, we'll make sure that, you know, you have a chance to, to, to have access to these books. But this book here is written by Dr. Jarvis Givens, and he's speaking to, in this book, Fugitive Pedagogy, 
Carter G. Woodson and the Art of Black Teaching, how when it comes to education, Black people have consistently had to deploy strategic tactics pursuing freedom through education. Enslaved people learn in secret places. During slavery up through Jim Crow, Black educators wore a mask of compliance in order to appease the white power structure while simultaneously working to subvert it. The physical and intellectual acts by Black teachers and students negated white supremacy and anti-Black protocols of domination, but they often did so in discreet or often a concealed fashion. So as, as African Americans or the enslaved are navigating these spaces, these educational spaces, whether they were in the woods, whether they was off in a, in a side room in the slave master's house, or whether they were in the slave quarters, whether they was out in the open field in the cotton fields, whether they was in the one room schoolhouses, the experience of education was always a lot of times in a space where there was the, the threat of, of danger, you was always at risk. You you know you was always putting yourself out there potentially to be able to have harm done to you because education in and of itself was a was a criminalized act. Education in and of itself could mean possibly life or death. Education in and of itself could mean your freedom, your family members' freedom. Uh, education could mean white surveillance. It could mean all different types of things. And you see uh, in historical documents and historical sources, those who have been caught with spellers in their hat or those who have been caught with pencils and those who have been caught trying to write being beat and being brutalized so traumatically that they would dare pick up a book or pick up a newspaper or a pamphlet again because that trauma that was stored in the memory would deter them for wanting to engage with those means of literacy and those instruments of literacy. And so you find even to this day, having to navigate the space of giving your best to your profession and trying to go all out, but yet also going above and beyond. And so even in this book, Dr. Jarvis Gibbons is speaking about uh, a scene. He begins about with a scene in Louisiana where there's a, a school teacher, I believe her name was Tessie McGee. And so she's uh, teaching the class. And this is a, a Black segregated school. And uh, she's teaching. And underneath the desk, she's got a Carter G. Woodson textbook that she's reading from, but it's underneath the desk. So that way, if somebody pops up, if some, if the higher ups or the school authorities up here, she's not caught with this book in her hand. And so these were the types of things that a lot of times had to occur in terms of being ingenious, being strategic, being clever, uh, finding ways to still learn and to still educate in these uh, dangerous uh environments and in these threatening spaces. Uh, and so uh, this book here speaks a lot to that. And so when we talk about some of the examples of just the laws that were in place uh, in terms of criminalizing Black education, according to Dr. Jarvis Given, South Carolina was the known to have the first anti-literacy law, which was in 1740, which was a response after the Stono Rebellion. And so what they found was that a lot of the uprisings and the rebellions were linked to those who were literate, those who could read, something about them being able to read and them being able to um, be intellectually astute and know how to write. Uh, it, it propelled them to, to take lead and lead the charge and be involved in these uprisings. And so Virginia, you know, followed suit in 1819. They implemented anti-literacy laws, but it just didn't start, uh, start and stop with South Carolina and Virginia. Um, Georgia and a whole host of other uh, colonies and other places throughout instituted anti-literacy laws. You know, and here's some examples of, of what some of these laws indicated. Every person who teaches a slave to write shall forfeit the sum of 100 pounds money. All nighttime religious meetings prohibited. All blacks free or enslaved denied um, right to hear colored preachers or ministers. So the Bible used to be 
uh, one of the significant books that was allowed to be read. But that ended up changing as well, too, because once again, uh, learning in secrecy and through church meetings and church gatherings, there was all types of ways where people were getting information, they were learning, they were plan planning, plotting, and strategizing. And this created a, a, a problem um, for the, for the uh, structural racism uh, and, and, and what was happening during this time. The enslaved and freed men prohibited um, from meeting for educational purposes. So just to be clear and to make the distinction, whether you was enslaved or free, it was a problem for you to be able to possess any kind of literacy. And so there's a lot of um, those who, there, there are those who would say uh, not many were literate during the time of uh, slavery on up through Jim Crow. Uh, most of the, uh, uh, the enslaved uh, could not read and could not write. And many were illiterate according to being able to, according to the standards um, that are, are there. However, I would suggest and argue that many more could read and write than they express or that they showed. And so one of the ways of resistance was to be able to dumb down and not give off that you knew as much as you knew, because if you did, then it can make you a target. Prohibiting unlawful assembly at any schoolhouse, church meeting house, or any other places. And so this was significant because the black church and schooling structures and educational institutions have always been the cornerstone for the Black experience. It's always been foundational to the development of Blacks um, in the community, uh, from, a, from a family cultural base, um, from a social historic base. And so this was really, really critical. And so even Frederick Douglass, yeah, as you see here in the, in the picture here, He's a young boy, and he actually is born in Maryland. He's sent off uh, to uh, be a playmate for a white boy. And the mistress here is teaching Frederick Douglass how to read because Frederick Douglass's playmate is learning how to read. And Frederick Douglass, who notices his playmate learning how to read, wants to then also learn how to, how to read. And he wants to learn, learn how to spell as well, too, until the slave master comes in and you know, slaps the book away and says he can't learn how to read because if he learns how to read, he's not going to be a good slave. So that experience right there really got the wheels in Frederick Douglass's head turning, even at a young age. And so he un didn't understand why could his playmate learn how to read and educate himself, and get, and and why was he privileged to to spelling and and he couldn't. So Douglas really focused the rest of his life on, you know, trying to become literate. He goes into town with a loaf of bread under his arm and, and tries to entice people and ask them if, if they could show him a thing or two about how to spell. And then he gives them bread to show his gratitude and appreciation. He finds papers and ditches and he takes them and folds them up and puts them in his pocket. He takes broken sticks and starts to, to uh, carve out symbols and, and tries to, to write out letters in the dirt and in the mud. He, he hides some of the books and he, he even speaks in his narrative about whenever he obtained his freedom and whenever he escaped, he did it. He had to make some decisions about what he was going to take with him and what he was going to leave behind. And with all of the things that he decided to take and with the things he decided to leave behind, the two things he said that he had to take of nothing else was a Bible and a blue book called the Columbian Orator, which was the book that he obtained, which was a book of speeches. And so that just speaks to just how powerful and how strong his quest to learn was. So once again, this Black educational heritage and tradition is central to the Black historical experience. So even with the banning of books, even with the erasure, even with the laws and all of these things coming from different angles and different sides at work, it still in many ways didn't stop African-Americans from being in this uh, pursuit and in this striving to obtain literacy and education. 
Here's some more examples. Georgia, North Carolina, Missouri, and other places banning instruction and education. Uh, historians have suggested over 250 uprisings were documented on North American soil. And once again, many of these uprisings had to do with those who were literate. And they found that um, Africans often possessed a greater desire to acquire literacy than poor whites, according to historians. And so Nat Turner, the Nat Turner story, and there's a, a movie um, that came out not too long ago about it, Birth of a Nation, but Nat Turner's story, um, you know, he was known to lead an uprising uh, in uh, 1831, where there was a number of, of whites who were killed, and they found that the spread of abolitionist literature was significant. Nat Turner was a minister. He was one who was literate. And as soon as this uprising took place, shortly thereafter, uh, there were more anti-Black literacy laws that were per that were uh, became more pervasive and ubiquitous throughout the South. And you find that school systems were shut down. So this was a major, major, major deal here. So when we look at Black elevation through education. It's not just about education, but it's what education could bring about. So we're talking about uh, status. We're talking about being able to uh, now uh, be self-possessed in a way where you have access to more resources. <clears throat> you could step out and exemplify your agency more. You can be able to uh, have a, a sense of, of power that you may not have had once before. And so as a result of uh, Blacks obtaining education and, 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 and struggling and striving to pursue education for liberation, we find that a number of schools began to be established. Now, it doesn't mean that there weren't already schools established, but we find that there were a number of uh, schools that continue to be established. <clears throat> HBCUs. Um, came about as a result um, of, once again, this Black educational uh, tradition and this Black educational heritage, legalization of names and establishment of churches, establishing businesses, family reunions. And another book that helps us speak to uh, family reunions and how uh, African Americans were, you know, getting married and 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 moving and shaking and doing all these different things in terms of the uprising of their status is a book called "Help Me to Find My People" by historian and author Heather Williams. Um, land ownership, and so you find the resilience in this information. You find the perseverance. You find another perspective, you find another side of the story, not just as we oftentimes hear Black victimization, but we see the, the entrepreneurial spirit. We see uh, the push and the tenacity to still make a way in situations many times where it was hard to see light at the end of the tunnel. And so um, black the Black print culture became very expansive in terms of uh, newspapers, in terms of abolitionist literature, in terms of letters and writing and different things like that, even textbooks, uh, which, which would, uh, we'll talk about a little bit later down the line. Black hospitals throughout the South started to also emerge. Uh, black men being elected to federal and state legislatures, specifically from 1869 to 1901, and a number of progressively black, uh, progressive, um, predominant black towns being established. And one of the things that would would be huge is even though this says 1865 to 1900, there would be a continuation of this. And Isabel Wilkerson speaks about this in her book, Warmth of Other Sons, when we talk about the great migration and how resisting with your feet and relocating and moving for better opportunities and for uh, just a better way of life. And so even in this image here, even in this picture, as you see this African-American male here, he's got his hat on, he, he's dressed uh, fairly decent there. He's sitting on the front row. 
of, of what I would say is a, looks like a railway car there. And you see the white male who's looking at him and he doesn't seem to be looking too happy or, or looking too thrilled there. You see the white woman behind with the child and you see this image here. You see this nice dressed black male. And so you, you can look at this image and, and, and draw many different conclusions. But one of the conclusions that I draw from that is black success to even be on the front row and to be dressed and presenting yourself in a certain way with your chest out, with a sense of confidence about yourself, a sense of uppityness, not staying in your place, so to speak. This was a problem. This was something that would challenge the, the, the racial institutional structure of the nation and of the country. And it would really rock the boat of race relations and create a whole lot of competition and a whole lot of challenges that we still see to this day. And so this right here is an example of that. And so Black success was one of the things that was a huge threat because Black success meant you no longer are in that assigned lot that you're supposed to be as intellectually inferior, lazy, shiftless, uh, and all those things that uh, have, have been said historically up to the present about the black uh, about the black body. And so once again, with the Emancipation Proclamation, all right, um, you know, you find that even before the Emancipation Proclamation, even before the Civil War, even before you know the Thirteenth Amendment and all of these things, blacks continue to take control of their educational institutions. They continue to pull their resources together, even if their resources were very minimal and few and far between, they still pull together their resources and the elements of their community to still bring about educational, uh, to provide education for their children and for the adults. In fact, there were times when the grown folks would be in the same class as the young folks. You know, there were times when, when the elders would be in class with the children. Sometimes, the, you know, the elders might not have had a chance to get educated much. And so they would return back because once again, the each one teach one spirit was very vibrant during this particular time. And so uh, the entity called the Freedmen's Bureau, which was uh, established uh, to, uh, by way of the government to help uh, fund some of the efforts to help the enslaved or the formerly enslaved get back on their feet. The education aspect of this was really uh, significant. Um, and so there's accounts um, in the book, The Education of Blacks in the South, 1860 to 1935, where they, they went all throughout the South and they wanted to collect data on you know, what areas needed support, what schools needed resources, you know, what was the state of Black education all throughout the South until they got a rude awakening. And John Alvord mentions that when he went throughout the South, he noticed that there was at least 500 schools already in operation. Yes, they could have perhaps used some additional funding. Yes, they could have used some additional resources. However, they were already established, they were up and running. And um, this impacted the, the, the assumptions that was made prior to um, from John Alvord, who was representing uh, the Freedmen's Bureau. And when he went throughout the South to try to see what he could do to, to, to save these schools or to, to, to support these schools. And so when we talk about education, by any means necessary in the midst of the, the violence and the danger and, and the laws that was in place, you see a host of a number of historical figures who still would stop at nothing and would use their clever and genius ways to still try to educate. So Lucy Laney from Georgia, you know, she actually was one to start a school that would uh, grow to uh, hundreds of black children, you know, when she was a pioneer, where she was, and she was had a passion to, to educate and, and to teach. Uh, John B. Meacham, he was known to start what was referred to as a riverboat school, where when the law said, okay, you can't educate on land, he said, all right, 
I'm going to take this on to the seashore. And he educated Black children on the boat. Anna J. Cooper of D.C., who was uh, uh, one of the first to women to get her Ph.D., um, and, you know, she was a, a teacher, she was an educator, and when she was in D.C. Uh, teaching, uh, many people were suspicious of what, was, what she was doing with those children because those test scores and, and the way that those students were advancing, it created some controversy and some red flags. So Anna J. Cooper um, was, was another educator um, who uh, made significant strides. Elijah P. Mars of Kentucky was a former soldier. He was able to acquire uh, certain levels of literacy in the service. And when he got out, he and his brother uh, ended up starting the school. And so even though he was uh, trained and established as an educator, he you know was literate, there were still those, there were still those who did not trust and believe that he knew his stuff. And so they made him do math problems. They made him have to spell stuff. You know, they made him have to prove and show his intellectual ability um, because at him being black and being able to be able to teach and be able to educate created a sense of cognitive dissonance. It, it was different than what they were accustomed to seeing. Millie Granderson of Virginia, she was known uh, to have a midnight school. So she would have a school in the woods that took place around midnight and she would teach those black children what, what the resources that she had. Martin Delaney, he was denied um, admission to Harvard, but yet he would still continue to educate himself and he would be a physician and he would help to be involved um, with treating different ailments and, and illnesses. And once his, once the community where he grew up um, nearby in West Virginia discovered that he had some literacy and literacy was in his family, they had to move town. They had to leave because they did not want, like the idea of a black or a black family being literate in the area. Frederick Douglass, we spoke about already before, but Frederick Douglass was one who had to also leave and go to Europe for a little bit of time because once he obtained his freedom and once he obtained his liberation and he would go out into the speaking circuit and he would speak and he was so articulate and he was so well-spoken, he even sung, he had a baritone voice and he uh, you know, was, was stout. He said, wow, I can't believe he ever was a slave. They didn't believe him. And so since he spoke about the injustice of slavery and how brutal and how abusive it was, he made himself a target. So he had to leave because there was a target on his back. Mary S. Peake, who was also a Black educator. And so she was passed about teaching you. So the, this is just a, a, a snapshot of many who have compelling stories that you could further delve into. Um, and it speaks to, once again, the different ways that Blacks have continued to strive by way of education. And so this individual here, William Shannon Gannett, speaks about as a missionary coming to the South, wanting to get in where he fits in, wanting to try to help out. But he said, whenever he came to the South and wanted to help, they said, hold up, be careful, we, we, we got this, we're okay. You know, and he speaks to, you know, the fact that, okay, you know, quote, they have a praiseworthy pride in keeping their educational institutions in their own hands. He says, quote, values of self-help and self-determination underlay the ex-slaves educational movement. So when we speak about education, it also, there's, there's a lot of trauma that is involved with education and it's, it's historical trauma that comes through DNA and, and, and through, um, through generations and through generations and through generations. And so between 1866 and 1877, more than 600 Black schools were burned down in the South. And so the, the threat of violence, the threat of hostility. And so we even can look at even today, looking at many of our HBCUs that have received bomb threats, being able to be present and read and engage with the lesson and listen to the teacher. It's hard to be present if all of these things are on your mind. It's hard to give your best to your education when this stuff is in your head. 
you know, it's hard to, to engage with your classmates. It's hard to put your best foot forward in the educational space. Um, and, you know, we see even now in contemporary times with the school violence and different things that are happening, um, it's, be, it's a challenge, not just for students, but also educators as well. And so another example um, is, a, is a family here, the Moore family um, in Florida, um, their home gets um, bombed on Christmas day in 1951. Uh, they were real active in terms of supporting and advocating for black teachers in terms of uh, uh, pay and salary and being treated um, you know, um, equitably, um, but they end up losing their life tragically to a bombing. So, you know, once again, uh, it's it's an act of bravery. It's an act of courage in terms of looking at the African American experience and trying to strive to learn amidst the effort to erase the history and the efforts to punish and bring about consequences for those that are trying to learn. And so uh, I'm not going to um, speak too much more on it because we do have another um, another week. This is a two part series, but I'll, I'll say this. Um, when we think about black history and we think about uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, um, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, even though he's referred to as the father of black history and he never referred to himself as black as, as the father of black history, but it was the historians and his contemporaries uh, and fellow educators who held him in such high regard and had such high respect for him, they bestowed that name to him. What he did was really just uh, an expansion and a continuation of the educational tradition that preceded him. Um, so, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, he was the first to get his uh, PhD from Harvard University in 1895. And then Dr. Carter G. Woodson, he ends up uh, in 1912 getting his PhD uh, from Harvard University. And so uh, whenever Carter G. Woodson passes uh, in 1950, Dr. Woodson writes his obituary and he says this, quote, what race prejudice can do to humans, to human soul and what is powerless to prevent. And when he is is when he puts that in the obituary of Dr. Woodson, he's speaking to just the efforts that Dr. Woodson continued to implore in terms of changing the narrative of black inferiority, uh, black laziness, um, because Dr. Woodson knew that a person's self worth, their self concept, their identity was inextricably bound to what the historical record had to say about them. And so when we talk about Black history, one of the quotes that Dr. Woodson is really known for is this quote here, do not wait until the last moment to prepare for Negro History Week. The time is nigh at hand. Secure the necessary literature at once and begin to plan immediately to demonstrate to the community what you and your coworkers have learned about the Negro during the year. So, before it was a month, it was a week, and it was Negro History Week. And he initially, and as he says, from day one on throughout time, over the course of his life, it was not just choosing one time to be able to celebrate the Black experience, but it was to really commemorate and celebrate and demonstrate what was taught about the Black experience throughout the whole year. There's a difference. And so Woodson very much stood on that. Dr. Woodson has a very compelling story um, and it's a children's book here, but it's a, I believe that this book here is a very powerful book that I would suggest anybody go get. It's a book called Carter Reads the Newspaper. And so uh, in this book, Carter Reads the Newspaper, it speaks about Carter's upbringing and Carter G. Woodson came from very humble beginnings, even though W.E.B. Du Bois uh, was um, the first to get his PhD um, from Harvard. Uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson was the first to get his PhD with two enslaved parents. And so Dr. Woodson, who was born in Virginia, his parents were enslaved. And so Dr. Woodson uh, didn't have much access to education. 
Uh, he worked hard, um, uh, manual labor jobs. And so he wanted to do all that he could do to try to help his family. And so as Dr. Uh, Woodson got older, uh, he remembered um, learning um, from his uncles who were soldiers in the war and you know uh, about literacy and, and how to write and how to read. And he later on is able to uh, get some work at a coal mine. And he meets a person named Oliver Jones at this coal mine. And so uh, he, uh, uh, he, Woodson is young, he's in his teens and Oliver Jones is a, is a veteran who, who fought in the war. And, and Oliver Jones couldn't necessarily um, read per se, but he sees something in Woodson and you know he he puts the paper in front of Woodson, the newspaper, and entices him and encourages him to read. And after they would finish their hard, back-breaking day out on that tough, rough, rugged coal mine, Oliver Jones would invite Carter G. Woodson and and some other fellows to uh, the home of uh, of where he lived, Oliver Jones, and they would put the newspaper in Carter G. Woodson hand, to Woodson's hands and ask him to read the you know the newspaper to them and they would have discussions and conversations off of what Dr. Carter G, what Carter G. Woodson would read. It could be all politics or what was going on in the world, con contemporary events. And whatever they didn't know, they would ask Carter G. Woodson to go out and find the answer and piece the story together. And Carter G. Woodson took great pride in that. He felt valued and he felt needed. And that right there helped him to the to begin the process of being a historian who would, who would seek out the information and seek out um, answers to questions uh, that he had. And so, <clears throat> and so it was, it was, you know, Carter G. Woodson, who was a former sharecropper and, and who was uh, toiling in the coal mines to develop that, that intense work ethic, he would take that work ethic and stop at nothing and devote his entire life to the advancement of the Black race in terms of changing the historical record and pushing back against uh, the, the racist narratives that would suggest that Blacks or Africans, African Americans had no history. And so when a quote um, from 1920 to Jesse Moreland, he says these words, quote, you should know enough about me to understand that I am the most independently hungry man in the United States. I once drove a garbage wagon in my hometown, toiled as a coal miner, oftentimes saw, my, saw the day where my mother had breakfast and didn't know where she would find her dinner. So he takes that work ethic, he takes that tenacity, he takes that hunger, that passion, that drive, and he would continue to put forth effort to uh, change the historical narrative and back it up with evidence and, and back it up scientifically because he was in spaces uh, get with uh, predominantly white male driven spaces where there were um, racist things that were said, uh, there were things that were put out that he felt was not true and it was inaccurate. So we had to come with citations, with documentation, with justification, for what he, what his stance was in terms of being able to legitimize black humanity and the black experience. And he remembers in, at Harvard in the class, even his teacher, the professor, the one who the students are supposed to look up to and the one who they're supposed to learn from, he gets into an argument from a time when the teacher, his, his professor says that, 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 that blacks have no history worth studying. They're, they have no history. And he pushed back and said, yes, we do. And so the teacher said, okay, prove me wrong. And so Carter continued to live his life pushing back and providing counter narratives to um, racist anti-Black um, uh, uh, ideologies. And so one of the things that, or one of the individuals who greatly inspired Carter G. Woodson was a person named George Washington Williams. And so um, a lot of us I'm sure have heard of the 1619 Project from Nicole Hannah Jones. Um, and, and she has done a tremendous work. But George Washington Williams doesn't get talked about too much in the conversation. And he was considered a historian. He didn't have the PhD or the, the, the academic um, credentials, so to speak. Uh, however, he was an author. He uh, was a former um, Civil War soldier. And he was actually the first to speak to 
the plight of the back of the black experience using 1619 as a marker and then going from there, George Washington Williams. And so Carter G. Woodson was inspired by him. So as I mentioned before, it wasn't just Carter G. Woodson doing all of the heroic things that he did by himself, but he looked to those who had come before him. He looked to his ancestors and he had, he was, he was raised up in a situation where even though his close ones, some of which were enslaved, um, and some of them were bound in certain ways, they still wanted him to learn. They still wanted him to educate himself. So um, he, George Washington Williams, uh, was one who was a huge, huge, huge uh, inspiration to Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this be my last slide here. And so next week, when we resume and pick up, we'll speak to more specifically, what were the things that Dr. Carter G. Woodson did to institute Negro History Week? And how did it then in time become what we know today as Black History Month? But there's two fundamental things that he focused his efforts on over the course of his lifetime. And that was legitimizing the teaching of Black history in academia. And it was popularizing Black history for everyday folks because he knew that some may not be able to understand or understand the scholastic scholarly jargon and the intellectual language, but he didn't want that to be a barrier for helping any person from being able to uh, learn the importance and the value of Black history. Uh, and so we'll spend time next Tuesday talking more specifically about what were the things that he did as an institution builder, as a visionary, as a teacher, as a leader, and how he paid the way for others. And we'll speak to also how all of this can shape our mental health and how we view ourselves moving forward. So I'm going to stop it right there. Um, because I, you know, do want to give some time for those who may have questions or reflections or some connections with what has been shared in case I, I glossed over something and also wouldn't mind taking a drink of water as well. So I'll uh, <laughs> turn it over to uh, you, Nancy or Sharice. I'll take a sip and then I'll also be more than happy to entertain any kind of questions or comments from there. And I'll unshare at this time as well, too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus. That was so interesting. And I know we all learned a lot and people are engaging quite a bit in the chat. So I will endeavor to have you answer as many questions as possible. We do have the next 20 minutes to answer questions. Um, my name again is Sharice. I'm from the Central Branch. I did put links um, in the chat for the other resources here at the Central Branch, including our equity resource collection and our red line exhibit. So please check that out. Um, Nancy and I did put as many links as we could to the resources mentioned by Marcus. We did have a question regarding um, the integration of the Howard County High Schools and Public Schools. And as Nancy mentioned, um, um, this is the, um, the second time we've had um, Marcus as a speaker. And Marcus mentioned that he did do a series on this prior and it will be posted on Howard County Library Systems YouTube channel. So as soon as it is available, we will be sharing that with everybody who has registered for this class. Please note that if you want to attend the second class, we're excited to have you. We're looking forward to the second session next Tuesday, same time, seven o'clock, but you do have to register separately. And the link to register is in the chat as well. Um, so please um, register if you are interested in that. Um, one quick question just to start off, Marcus, somebody did ask about the Anthony Browder book, um, and I did post the link to the Nile Connection. Was there any other um, Browder book that um, you wanted to point out to people? Well, so, so this 
the um which is what I raised up initially in case oh, the, okay so we do have that one okay fine so now, I wanted to be sure that was correct okay now now he has a few different other books as well so he has um a book called Egypt on the Potomac and um he also has a book called the Browder Files and so a lot of Dr. Browder's work and, he, and he's still um still living he's still He's still doing his thing. He's still traveling to the continent of Africa. You know, a lot of our great scholars and uh, historians, you know, have passed on. But uh, the central part of his work is really looking at the Africanity and the African, how the African uh, remnants and the residual effect of, of what stemmed from Africa and African cultural value traditions, how that still shows up and is still relevant today in where we find ourselves in the country. And so, for example, for quite a long time, he had been doing a tour all throughout Washington, DC, because from the Washington Monument, uh, you know, from Lincoln Memorial and a number of different um, archeological structures um, and, and from the design and the layout of Washington, DC, he likes to point back and show the, the connection and the and the and the, the tie back to African culture, but I would say those are three solid works of his to definitely get. And then he even has a daughter named Atlantis, and she has a children's book, My First Trip to Africa, as well too. So just you know, you can go online and and put his name up, and you'll see all of the stuff that he has. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a number of um, interesting questions here. Um, One thing that has been frustrating for me is advocating the fact that Black History Month is a celebration of ADOS contributions and not so much about African continent history. Do you have thoughts about that? Okay. Uh, well, so thank you for thank you for the comment. Um, so I don't believe um, everybody is familiar with what ADOS is and ADOS from my understanding is uh, African descendants of slaves. Um, so I'm gonna look back at this again and make sure that I properly address what's being said here. Uh, okay, yeah, so what I'm getting is, okay, how can we include the elements of the African continent as well? Um, it's interesting because you're you're in my head because I'll speak to this more next week. So make sure you come back next week. But what that what what Dr. Carter G. Woodson wanted to do in his Negro History Bulletin that he would establish, and a lot of his teachings um, in his uh, in the speaking circuit that he was in, um, he wanted to definitely tie in the African experience. He wanted to include that, and it wasn't really for him. Okay, this is the African experience and those who identify with that. And then you have those who are descendants of slaves. He wanted to connect all of that because he came from the standpoint that we have had enough division already amongst ourselves. And so he understood that there was room and space and the need to embrace the the, the African roots and the, and, the, and the values and traditions that have been brought here and yet know that that didn't stop here and that, um, you know, on the plantation, there's a lot of the rituals and the elements of culture that really uh, it, it, uh, it, it, it continued on just may have manifested in different ways that is still relevant. So there, so, so, looking at it from what I believe the lens of what Dr. Carter G. Woodson would have looked at it through, he would have felt the need to, to connect it all and tie it all together. And in his writings and in some of his educational materials, you can see that. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another um, attendee who says, excellent presentation. We know a lot of the techniques being used today to erase the contributions of Black Americans and deny their political activism are very old and have been done in the past. Do you see anything being attempted today that strikes you as new? In terms of efforts to deny the political activism? 
Um, I, would- I mean, I, I, you know, in terms, I think, I think the spirit of the question is, are there different techniques today to, of erasure? Or is there more aggressive attempts at erasure and different strategies to make sure that voices aren't heard? You know, particularly even in this day of social media where there are so many ways to get your message out. Well, so so I'm, I would say I'm, I'm not surprised. Um, and, and for a considerable part of the presentation, what was expressed was the the efforts historically up until recent times of methods and practices and and ways and means of trying to erase the history now this is 2022 and so there are different elements like you said Sharice, that we are dealing with now that wasn't so much a factor as it was in 1865 or 1922 or even or even (laughs) 2000, Um, you know, and social media is huge. Um, One of the things that you'll notice when you look at the pattern and the way history goes is anytime there's usually a major monumental event, um, a a hate crime or or something that is significant, uh, you find the backlash, whether it's uprisings, whether it is um, more killings, um, you know, so for example, when you look at what happened with George Floyd, that right there was enough to shake people up. And it wasn't just black people, it was a lot of people in different places. They, I, you know, it was, it was a lot. It was, it was, it was heavy. Many wanted to get out and do something, even if they didn't know where to start, where to begin. Many wanted to be an activist or learn and educate themselves more, reflect on their own biases and things like that. But you go back in the past in time and you look at how, you know, Black history even um, became a month and, and, and how Black history ended up becoming into the schools um, from, a, from a higher education standpoint in the 60s. Well, in the 60s, there was the sit-ins and there was the assassination of Malcolm X and there was the assassination of, 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 of Dr. King and there was the uprisings and these triggering events or these events that serve as a catalyst for people to, you know, want wanting to, to do something. So once again, you see historically how it really can impact the present and you see what happens in the past shows up, you know, kind of in similar ways. Um, have I seen anything new? Off the top of my head, I can't say that I've seen anything new per se, but uh, it does help a lot of times, and even research supports this, when you know history and when you know what has happened prior to us where we are today, it doesn't necessarily shock you in the same way. It doesn't really um, startle you or surprise you in the same way. If, yeah, it might make you angry, or yeah, of course, it could bring up certain feelings and emotions. However, there's research that supports that knowing history can even be a tool to help you overcome. Knowing history can be a, um, could be a, a protective means because since you, you have a point of reference to know, okay, well, if Harriet Tubman persevered in this way, or Frederick Douglass went through oppression and racism and persevered through this way, or if such and such persevered through this way, I can use their stories as leverage and as a tool and apply that to my present situation and persevere and push through. And that's why it's so important to go beyond the narratives of victimization and and passivity and all the things that were done to Blacks and and really interject the agency, the resilience, the perseverance, the courage, um, the bravery, and all of that. That also must be incorporated into history as well, too. Um, you discussed the um, delay in having Harriet Tubman's name on the building. Do you know, um, one of our attendees asked this question, um, is there a county initiative to legislate a um, naming process? And are there different, I'm wondering, are there differences between the states and, and what what legislation is in place in terms of naming public places and denaming public places according to 
um, you know, the accurate, the accurate history? Sure. Well, um, I'm, I, I think that's a great question. There actually is recently um, a, a county initiative um, that has um, been issued um, during uh, Calvin Ball's tenure to um, look at public spaces, the names of schools, the names of uh, buildings throughout the county, parks, um, and look at the namesakes and, and, and come up with a, with a systemized process of, okay, are, do, these, do these names need to remain as they are? Do we need to, to do a little bit of research and, 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 and find the root of, of, and the cause of how they came to be? And do we need to come up with another name? And what's the history behind it? So there actually was an initiative with that um, that recently took place to um, begin the process of really um, more critically examining a lot of um, what was in Howard County and how these names came to be and what these names represent. You know, there's a lot of history that's tied up into names oftentimes. And, uh, you know, Howard County, you know, was a place that I grew up in. It's a place that I, I love. I still live in Howard County. I, I've been a teacher here in Howard County uh, Public School System for quite some time. But, you know, I have to be honest, Howard County also has had plantations. Howard County has also uh, had slave labor. Howard County has also, um, had um, you know slave quarters and all of these different things, and so once again, that's what makes history so complicated. It's not simple, um, and so if we could just continue to to grapple with uh, the the complications of history, as uncomfortable as it is, it could definitely be a good thing. <clears throat> yeah, grab, grab some water. <laughs> we have um, so many comments in the chat thanking you for this presentation and remarking on how the teachers who are listening tonight want to share a lot of this with their students. Um, one of um, the um, attendees did comment that the resources are so limited um, in terms of sharing with different age children regarding these subjects. So that, that's, that's an idea to put in your head, Marcus. Um, you know, uh, working on resource lists for different age um, students that um, we can share with the community. Um, there's also a, a very um, good question about um, the longtime um, African American historian. I, I don't want to mangle the name, Benjamin Quarles of Morgan State. When he was at the the um, person in the chat comments, when he was at the University of Wisconsin in the 1930s, he initially had to write his master's thesis on a white subject because his professors claimed that there wasn't enough source material about black subjects. And um, only later was Quarles allowed to write his PhD thesis about Frederick Douglass published in 1948, which became one of the source materials for um, another recent book. So um, it sounds like this person would love for you to talk you know, more about um, this educator as well. Um, they say Professor Quarles focused his writing uh, about Black contributions to American society from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War. So I didn't know if you wanted to talk about this individual at all tonight or add it to one of the topics you could review as part of your presentation. No, well, uh, well, Benjamin Quarles is definitely a, a, a historical pioneer in his own right. Um, you know, um, when I think about Quarles and um, I think about um, him, I, and I think I um, I posted something I posted something about this uh, via Facebook um, in January because Quarles is one of the historians who actually had a birthday in January, amongst others. Um, but yeah, Morgan State, you know, representing Morgan State, I got my um, my uh, lapel pin from Morgan State. Um, but no. Um, Benjamin Quarles is definitely one who should be known. Uh, his story is is not uh, unique compared to what many historians, especially uh, Black historians, had to undergo during these times where they're the minority. I mean, they're in these spaces that are predominantly anti-Black, not just physically, but ideologically and intellectually. 
And so um, he continued to persevere um, and he continued to put a lot of good stuff down that we could go back and, and look into and, and delve into to help us understand the Black experience. I know that I um, borrowed a lot from his research um, when I was writing my master's thesis, but also when it comes to resources, um, you know, and th there's, there's a ton of resources out here now. Um, can there be more? Of course. Um, but, you know, you all, the library to start with <laughs> um, are a great valuable resource. Um, I had a slide of some resources as well to be able to share, um, uh, but uh, I could always share that, um, you know, next week and whatnot. But I mean, you have museums, you have um, different, um, there's all types of stuff on YouTube now that you could look at. Um, you know, there's a lot of different um, webinars, things, but yeah, I would, I would say though, you know, we have the Howard County Historical Society, uh, which is, which is huge and, and really, and it really depends, you know, when we're talking about resources, you know, I mean, every, there's resources for children, you know, there's resources for educators, teachers, so, you know, um, yeah, it just depends on what kind of resources we need. But there is a lot of resources out there. However, once again, and you could even talk to a lot of archivists and those who are in the research institutions, and they would, uh, um, you know, and I've had conversations with a lot of archivists, and um, there have been a number of cases where, you know, even what is deemed important and valued to preserve has not necessarily always had the same level of importance as perhaps non-Black information and data. And this isn't this isn't to say this is every situation in every case, but um, that erasure, once again, it unfortunately has permeated um, every fact or every, every segment of, 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 of where we, where we tend to look. Um, and so, um, yeah, good, good questions and good, good comments. Yes. Um, let me finish with one question. Um, one last question. We have so many questions and comments in the chat. I wish we could get to everything, but um, unfortunately we can't. Um, we did have a question about whether you feel that other minority groups and um, underrepresentation is being addressed in the county. And do you feel that there is um, some effort in the educational system to, you know, also address other communities and making sure that, you know, students are educated about that. And do you think the problem with not covering um, various different minority groups is getting uh, better or worse? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh... Well, I, I would I would say that 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 really depends. So there's a lot of lot of nuance to that question. You know, every school is different. Um, school leadership is different in terms of administrators, those who are on board with certain initiatives, those who support um, certain efforts. You know, with the DEI co uh, coalitions and committees in the schools and efforts to you know so so it so first of all it really a lot of times depends on the administrator and the principal and, and whatnot um the county has been intentional about uh, providing spaces um to usher along having difficult conversations um from book studies to different trainings um you know creating spaces where there could just be conversations to talk about things. Um, is there a need for, for much more? I would say yes, um, because there are those who might look at perhaps uh, salary and, and perhaps what certain positions may get, or there may be those who may look at the African-American studies course. Why is it an elective and not a prerequisite to graduate when other courses are? Or why is it only given at this particular time. So, you know, so um, there definitely is a need for more. Um, I've seen, you know, the school system try to also at times partner, you know, with the library, different things like that, uh, because the school system is only one thing, uh, one entity, it's the school system. Um, 
I also would 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 say that a lot of times there's there's a, a focus on on the school system to to do a lot of different things and and the school system should, but I think it all the onus is also up to the parents as well too to make sure that there is a solid foundation in terms of um, exposure and 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 sharing and teaching um, the student. Now some parents might say, well, I'm not a teacher. That's their job, but but being a parent is also a teacher as well too. Um, and so that was one of the things that Carter G. Woodson was big on was the community aspect of education and collaboration. Um, so, um, so, so yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of work to be done um, in the school system. There have been efforts, you know, uh, progressive efforts to try to focus on some of these things, um, but um, there's, there's still definitely some work to be done. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that answer. And I, I do want to mention again, the equity resource collection here at the central branch, because it does cover um, many groups, um, non non white groups, um, different groups of, of color, different religions, it covers the um, differently abled populations. So I can't recommend our collection enough. It includes books, videos, um, CDs, music. We have a section in our teen area, our children's area, and our adult area. So it really tries to address all the different age levels and educational levels in our community to be able to access additional materials. Because it is true what, what you said, Mark, is it, it isn't all the school's responsibility. And it isn't all the parents' responsibility either. And also, we continue to learn as we go through our lives. And um, we continue to see more scholarship on these topics. And um, you know, the, the intention of the Howard County Library System is to keep this collection up to date and to continue to expand it according to the needs of the community and the new things we're learning. So I do encourage everybody to um, come and access that collection. I want to thank you again, uh, Marcus. We, we do need to draw this to a close um, from looking at the chat. Everybody has been very appreciative. We will send out emails to the people who are registered, which include the resources that were discussed tonight, any links to recordings. We have the recordings from um, um, Marcus's previous series. We have recorded tonight's as well. As a reminder, please do register if you want to attend next week because it is a separate registration. There is a link in the chat and we will include it in our email to feedback as well because we welcome your feedback on this lecture as well as any future lectures that you would like to hear. So thank you very much. And before I stop recording, is there anything else, Nancy or Marcus, that you wanted to say to our group? Well, I'll just say uh, thanks, everybody, once again, and I hope that everybody uh, comes back for a part two because there's a lot more for us to discuss and, and a lot more to be presented. But um, it was fun. I'm looking forward to next week. So thanks, thanks for having me, everybody. Yes, and I, we are I, I all echo, looking forward to it. I echo that sentiment. I want to thank Marcus. We have had this planned in, in, for months, and so we're excited to finally be here together tonight and to share it all with you. Have a lovely evening, and we look forward to seeing all of you next week. We'll be sharing the multitude of resources that were in the chat and presented in Marcus's presentation in a follow-up email. Thank you, everyone. All right. Good night.